Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. We've all heard it and if you're a parent, you've said it more than once. Don't go outside without your coat. Colder weather means that more layers and warmer coats and jackets are needed. And nowadays, cheaper synthetic fibers have filled in for more expensive natural insulators like down. And now a Vermont company has come up with a homegrown filler to counter the colder weather. It's made from a fiber that many of us find in our backyards or blowing in the breeze. Rebecca Gollin has our story. This is milkweed. It's a wildflower that's found in Vermont and around the Northeast. It's long been a nuisance for farmers, growing readily on roadsides and in backyards. But it's a favorite of pollinators, especially monarch butterflies, who lay their eggs and feed on the plant. Along with the environmental benefits, milkweed produces a fiber that's lightweight, water repellent, and most important for Vermonters, it's warm. It's great. It's very lightweight, which I really like, and it's um, very warm and it blocks the wind. Um, that's partly from the cover fabric. What is so incredible about this particular fiber, it can be used for all sorts of different purposes. It can be stuffing inside a jacket. It can be used for flotations and life jackets. Kimberly Hagen and Susie Hodgson work at the University of Vermont's Center for Sustainable Agriculture. They're spearheading a project that looks at the costs and benefits of growing milkweed as a crop here in Vermont. That project led them to Charlotte Sullivan. We've done a lot of research and development. We've made a lot of different jacket prototypes. We've worked a lot with raw milkweed floss, which is that those the little parachutes that attach themselves to the seeds. Sullivan is an artist and founder of the clothing company May West. She and her partner are experimenting with using milkweed in their jackets. It's not a new idea, but certainly our application of it is. Sullivan has spent time working in agriculture, and that experience informs what she's hoping to create. As someone who's, who always works outside, I don't like feeling like I'm, what I'm having to wear in cold weather is cumbersome, it's hard to move in. I don't like having to have a lot of layers. The thought of being able to wear something that's not synthetic, that's thin and malleable um, and flexible while being you know, warm and also naturally water resistant just seemed too good to be true. Through the partnership with UVM, Sullivan was able to get raw milkweed fiber to experiment with. After some testing, the company is pretty close to a design that can be produced on a larger scale. Most recently, we've also been able to start prototyping jackets using milkweed in a batting form. So what that means is it's a material that you can actually cut. It's in a roll and you can cut it out and then sort of insert it into a pattern. We've been able to make different jackets and sort of test them out and feel them and experiment with different materials. Those two were before the batting and then Kimberly and I are wearing jackets that actually have um, batting quilted to the inside on mine, on the inside layer, and on Kimberly's on the outside. And then these For Hodgson and Hagen, it's still the early days in terms of figuring out the best practices for growing milkweed as a crop and other resources for farmers. Answers won't come immediately, as it takes at least three years to establish the plant as a crop. But these researchers think there's promise. Two-thirds of the American public think using renewables is important. Most people think of renewables or think of energy, and now people are starting to think of, actually, what about everything else we use in our house? Not just the food we buy, but let's think about the clothes that we buy and wear. Are they made in a sustainable way? In the long run, this will be great for Vermont farmers because we have a product that grows here already, um, you know, and happily so, and that we can use it. It's a new way for farmers to diversify while giving some important pollinators the habitat they need. And while the economic results are not finalized, so far, milkweed is proving to be beneficial all around.
When I learned that there was that connectivity with milkweed and monarchs and how, of course, with, with my farming background, knowing that without pollinators, it's, you know, it doesn't matter how much you know about growing food, you don't have anything. It was just so <laughs> clear that we really had to keep working with this material and develop a way for it to be used in the market. So this is really new. Yep. This, this Bringing new products to life raw, with a sustainable raw, fiber that could give some new options to Vermont's farmers. In Middlebury, I'm Rebecca Gullen with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca. There's a long, cold winter before the sap starts running again, but any day that ends in Y is a good day for maple syrup. Maple is big business in Vermont, and it's getting bigger. Here's Keith Silva with a story of a sugar maker who's going for the liquid gold. From the outside, Goodrich's Maple Farm in Eden doesn't look like a traditional sugar house. But make no mistake, this building has one purpose and one purpose only, making maple syrup. We boil sap. That's what we do. Uh, we take water out of sap to turn it into maple syrup. The Goodrich family began turning sap into syrup in 93, 1793. They sugared for another century and a half before calling it quits in the 1950s. By the time Glenn Goodrich and his wife Ruth returned to the old ways, they had to start from scratch. In 1979, I went into maple only knowing how to gather buckets. I had never boiled before, I hadn't done any retailing before, didn't know anything other than how to dump a sap bucket into a gathering pail and bring it to the gathering tank. That's what I knew about maple. We had no idea of turning it into a business. But it's a little bit uh, contagious or addictive. Since their start, Glenn and Ruth have built a thriving maple business. They sell and install maple equipment, ship syrup worldwide, and have become ambassadors for Vermont Maple. A couple of years ago, Green Crow Timber Company asked Glenn to consult on 6,000 acres of forest land in Eden. At the time, he didn't think it would have much to do with maple. Lots of times when a timber company owns a piece of land, they're not focusing on maple trees to produce sap. They're looking at logs. And, and so I suspected that this wasn't going to be a very suitable site for maple production. Uh, but when I studied the maps, the topo maps and aerial photographs, and then walked the property, uh, we discovered that, yes, this is a very good maple site. To have a tract of land this big that can all flow to a couple of drainage sites it just doesn't happen very often. I've been installing tubing systems professionally throughout the U.S. Uh, for 30, 40 years, and there just aren't many out there. So we then turned from being a consultant into being a uh, potential renter of the property. In May, Goodrich and a work crew of nine started tapping trees and running tubing. 1,532,000 feet of tubing to be exact. That's 290 miles, or about the distance from Eden to Bar Harbor, Maine. So far, 36,000 taps have been installed a drop in the bucket compared to what Goodrich plans to do. Each year, we will add approximately 50,000 taps. This past year, we've uh, fallen a bit short of that, that uh, goal because we had to build the sugar house and the pump station and the pump line and do lots of infrastructural things to prepare for the next years. Uh, we're pretty confident that this uh, next year we'll get uh, 60,000 plus added and so a year from now we'll be boiling from 100,000 taps and then add the 50,000 each year after that. By 2021, Goodrich plans to have 200,000 taps installed. I'm 62 years old and most people at this point in their life wouldn't want to jump out and do something like this but challenge is what I have always thrived on and so here we go. The sugar house Goodrich built to process all this sap measures 10,800 square feet. There's only one evaporator in here right now. The plan calls for installing three more. At the back of the sugar house is where the sap is stored. At full capacity, 
it will take 28 minutes to fill one of these 13,000 gallon sap tanks. Goodrich has put in five in all. To get the most sugar content out of the sap, sugar makers rely on reverse osmosis. Referred to as an RO, this machine filters out water and concentrates the sugar and minerals in the sap. In addition to this higher concentration, ROs also reduce fuel consumption by 80%. Raw sap, 2%, it takes 44 gallons of sap to make a gallon of maple syrup. Here we're concentrated to 30%, and so it takes three gallons to make a gallon. And so you can see uh, the efficiency is huge. Our own machine can handle 6,000 gallons of sap per hour. The evaporator here is boiling about a little less than 500 gallons per hour. Um, so huge reduction in volume through the RO machine. Efficiency is a big part of being successful in this business, whether it be energy efficiency or human resources efficiency. Uh, you have to really focus on efficiency to make it work. Where the efficiencies, size, and scale of this operation sugar off to is in the growing market for maple. So that's a big deal. Our demand for maple syrup is rising somewhere between five and eight percent per year and that we need to increase the production to match that demand. So there's money in maple? Ah, uh, yeah there's a lot of money in it. We just try to keep a little of it. <laughs> maple production is no joke. Nationwide, sugar makers are making more syrup than ever before. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, maple syrup production in the United States went from 3.4 million in 2015 to 4.2 million gallons of syrup in 2016. That's a 20% increase. 2016 was a record year for production, but in 2017, sugar makers topped that mark by an additional 2%, going from 4.20 to 4.27 gallons of syrup produced. Mark Isselhart, maple specialist with the University of Vermont Extension, says the current growth in maple syrup production is due to expanding markets and consumer interest in this one-of-a-kind product. It's a sweetener. Fundamentally, that's what maple is. It's a sweetener. There are lots of other sweeteners that are less expensive, but maple has lots of things going for it. Very simple uh, ingredient list. You're just boiling sap down. It has a unique blend of minerals that aren't found in other, other sweeteners. And it has the story of, of being, you know, produced from, from trees over many, many years. So it has a lot of, uh, of attraction. And there's been work done marketing and growing the markets globally. So it's no longer just a regional product. It's actually being sold in Asia. It's being sold in Europe. It's being sold elsewhere. And so that demand grows and there is need for more production, so people are jumping in. In his role as an educator and researcher, Isselhart focuses on making sure Vermont's maple industry is sustainable and maintains its value in the culture of Vermont. Tree health is still critical. I mean, you're talking about tapping trees over the long term. So you have to do it in a responsible way, a sustainable way that maintains tree health, as well as providing for new generations of maple trees to be growing underneath. There's only so many places in the U.S. that have the density of tappable trees, the climate that is suitable for ideal sap flow, and a workforce and a tradition of producing it and the know-how. And Vermont has all three. While the look of Goodrich's maple farm differs from the traditional imagery of maple sugaring, the quality of the product remains constant. I will acknowledge that there is a, some tension between the way sugaring used to be done or the imagery of sugaring and the way it's done now. And what I think of is, are people more concerned about the product or the process? Because the process of making syrup is very different. But fundamentally, the product needs to be the same high quality that it always has been. The imagery is stuck in the 1800s, but the industry has moved on. The industry has, has adapted. For Glenn Goodrich, the more things about sugaring change, the more sugaring stays the same. I had two old fellows in here yesterday, and they said, oh, gee, back when we did it, we used buckets and it was hard. And I said, well, it's still very hard. We just 
plan to do more trees per man now than we ever have done before. It's, it's like driving a car. If you started and learned to drive on a 1950 Chevy, do you mind driving your new BMW? Probably not. It's going to be fun just the same. And that's the way it is in Maple. No matter how much sap flows from the trees or boils in the pans, sugaring is farming. And farming is hard work. The Goodrich family doesn't seem to mind the work. You might even say they're sweet on it. In Eden, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Thanks, Keith. And that's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.